This is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I'm your host, Davy Crockett. Thanks. Thanks for coming. This is episode 138, the ninth part of the Grand Canyon Rim to Rim series to enhance your next Grand Canyon run. I recently published my book, Grand Canyon Rim to Rim History, which included many newly discovered stories that I had not previously included in this podcast. In this episode, I will cover the story of the very early years of Phantom Ranch in the 1920s when it aided rim to rim travel. Grand Canyon! Grand Canyon! Grand Canyon! Grand Canyon! Make sure you get my best selling book, Grand Canyon Rim to Rim History, on Amazon in paperback, hardback, Audible, and Kindle. 290 pages packed with more than 400 historic photos. I've added about 50 pages of fascinating stories since its first printing. Mm-hmm. Run, come see what this river has done. Carve the walls of Grand Canyon with the colors of the rising sun. In 1906, Dave Rust established a permanent camp near the confluence of Bright Angel Creek and the Colorado River that they named Rust Camp. They dug irrigation ditches and planted cottonwood trees by transplanting branches cut from trees found in nearby Phantom Creek. The camp was visited mostly by hunters going to and from the North Rim. Theodore Roosevelt visited the camp in 1913 for a few hours and was renamed to Roosevelt Camp. By 1917, the government revoked the permit for the camp and it became deserted. As the Grand Canyon National Park was established in 1919, funds became available to develop the park and its trails. Phantom Ranch, a Grand Canyon jewel, was ready to be built. In 1921, the Fred Harvey Company started major construction near the Rust or Roosevelt Camp to establish a tourist destination at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Designs were under the direction of Mary Jane Coulter, and the structures were architected by others. The Fred Harvey Company and Mary Coulter designed the cabins Phantom Ranch in 1922. Coulter designed her cabins to blend in she wanted this place to speak for itself. Initially, the ranch was referred to as Roosevelt Chalet. Early in 1922, progress was reported. The Fred Harvey Company has had a force of 15 to 20 men constructing Roosevelt's Chalet near the mouth of the Bright Angel Creek. Substantial stone cottages in a central mess hall and social center are well underway. No expense is being spared to make the camp one of the great attractions for Grand Canyon visitors, especially those who wish to make the muleback trip from rim to rim via the new Kaibab Suspension Bridge. The new swinging suspension bridge was being used daily by park rangers and Fred Harvey pack trains. Soon Coulter insisted that the ranch be named after the side creek nearby named Phantom Creek. Phantom Ranch was initially advertised to be a sort of halfway house for South Rim sightseers who wanted to make a three-day trip to Ribbon Falls and back without camping out, or make a seven-day trip to the North Rim and back. For tourists making rim-to-rim trip, it is a natural stopover and resting place. The longer trips can be taken either in hiking or horseback parties. In each instance, there are government guides with each party and these men besides knowing every inch of the country, are entertaining with their short talks on the points of interest that are encountered. Phantom Ranch opened on June 15, 1922, with four cabins, a lodge with a kitchen, and a dining hall. The ranch was designed to be self-sufficient with an orchard of peach, plum, and apricot trees. Also included was a chicken shed and yard, a blacksmith shop, a water reservoir, and a barn. Additional cottonwood trees were planted. The cabins had two beds, a fireplace, baths, showers, running water, and eventually telephones connected to El Tovar Hotel on the South Rim, and electricity. It was boasted, It is the deepest down of any canyon ranch in the world. Nothing is like it anywhere else. 
Coulter built these cabins and, and started to draw a new kind of audience into the bottom of Grand Canyon. The wealthiest of the tourists, authors, artists, oil and steel magnets, people that could afford a trip to travel by train from the East Coast, then to ride the mules to the bottom of Grand Canyon, stay multiple weeks on end down here. Spent the night down in the canyon at the lovely Fathom Ranch. The river is a wistful dream, the sky serene and vast. A guest in 1924, Walter I. Pratt of Iowa wrote, At Phantom Ranch, we found three sleeping cabins with four beds each, a large central building with the kitchen, a dining room, a garden that was just getting started, a barn, and a chicken house. Bright Angel Creek is out the backyard and an irrigation ditch at our front door. Green grass is all about, and many small trees have just been set out. Small boulders have been piled in rows, making most of the fences. Two years ago, it was just desert. Rates to stay there were $6 per person per day. Phantom Ranch was staffed with a married couple as caretakers who worked very hard to make guests feel welcome. The Phantom Ranch caretaker in 1924 was an Irishman, Noah Kelly, who had tended bar in Williams, Arizona for 16 years. His duties were described as, quote, head cook, dishwasher, chambermaid, bottle washer, all in one. Kelly was very friendly. When asked about rattlesnakes, he said that they had only killed 16 along the trails the previous year. We had king snakes too, but we made pets of them. They chase the rattlers away and keep the rats and mice out of the cabins. If you have mice in your house, the king snake will crawl down the chimney if it can't get in any other way. We only had three of them last year. He downplayed the pack rats. They aren't bad. Sure, they steal your combs and stockings, but for anything they take, they always leave you a stone. I have had them steal my money. A group gathered, listening to this colorful man. There were only two small wooden benches, so the men were seated on the ground with their backs propped up against the flat side of boulders. As dusk approached, bats flew above and occasionally seemed to take a dive at them. Phantom Ranch was named after Phantom Canyon and Creek, which joins Bright Angel Canyon in the box, about two miles above the ranch area. How did Phantom Canyon get its name? Today people are told that Phantom Canyon got its name because it seems to appear and reappear in a phantom-like haze. Others say early explorers would miss the creek because it was so hidden. Still others are told that from the south rim it cannot be seen and thus was a phantom. There is no historical evidence for these reasons. They are false, sanitized narratives that evolved to not scare away visitors. The true eerie story was told consistently by Phantom Ranch caretakers in the 1920s. Early Phantom Ranch caretaker Noah Kelly explained that a prospector, John Shane, who he knew well, was killed there years earlier at the mouth of a side canyon just up the creek. A stone had fallen off the wall and, quote, smashed him flat. When prospectors and hunters were in the area, they kept seeing a strange light on the wall where Shane had been killed. They thought it was spooky, and the canyon was called Phantom Canyon. Kelly said he had seen this strange light during a storm. I saw what looked like someone carrying a lantern from place to place. Then it would go out and in a minute would come again. It sure would. And sometimes it was just awfully dim-like. And then it would brighten up and the thunder kept on rolling. I just laid in bed and covered up my head. I sure did. When Ralph Pearson of Bloomington, Illinois stayed at Phantom Ranch in 1926, he looked for the Phantom. That evening at Phantom, we talked and played cards, and hoped that the phantom would appear. Many claim that they have seen a whitish shape fitting around in the recesses on the high cliffs, but I didn't see any sign of the ghost. In 1927, a correspondent for the Kansas City Star wrote, 
Phantom Ranch is so called for the excellent reason that it has a phantom. I did not see it myself because it appears only to the guilty, but I know it is there because many who have seen it told me about it and described it. Their descriptions do not all agree, but descriptions seldomly do, especially for descriptions of phantoms. The phantom appears at night on the face of the mountain. It is white, as all phantoms are, and has something of the shape of a veiled human figure. I made the discovery that the chalet that had been assigned to me was right on the foot of the cliff on which the phantom appears. With all the mountains around there, it had to be one over my roof that was thus distinguished. He spent a sleepless night hearing spooky noises. It is understandable why others in the future did not want people to know the true story of Phantom Ranch's namesake. Mrs. Lloyd Day from Louisiana wrote, One cannot see Grand Canyon from the rim. The trip down is an experience full of thrills, and when one realizes that everything to eat at Phantom Ranch, all supplies and accommodations, have to be transported by pack mules, there comes a tender feeling in the heart of our friend, the mule. Leona Powell of Kansas City, Missouri, visited Phantom Ranch in 1925. She wrote, Never did a place look so inviting as did those little stone cottages nestling in a little green spot surrounded by sheer rock walls hundreds of feet high. One of the first things I saw down there was a mowing machine while a little further was a tiny field with a hay rake. Phantom Ranch is a fully equipped ranch, yet on a very tiny scale. Phantom Ranch has every convenience, with the exception of ice, to take care of the venturesome who make the trip down the lone trail. Someday they expect to have an ice plant in the canyon, but it is now impossible to transport it down there. Because of the warmth during the winter, visitors came down into the canyon year-round. On December 14, 1925, an amazing ad hoc party was held at Phantom Ranch with 20 people. George Shields, the leader of the Kanab Utah Band, put on a concert playing the cornet, the violin, and then sang vocal solos. Others joined in as the sound echoed off the cliffs. Two weeks later, 40 members of the Sierra Hiking Club of San Francisco stayed for several days. Other hiking clubs came down, choosing to make the journey on foot instead of riding on mules. Word was getting around the hiking community that going down by foot into the canyon was much more enjoyable than on mules. The official National Park Service guide stated, It is a sad mistake for persons not in the soundest physical training to attempt on foot. Nearly every day, one or more trampers, overconfident of their endurance, find the way up to arduous and have to be assisted by guides and mules sent down for them from the rim. They charged five dollars for this service. Royalty descended into the canyon in 1926. Prince Gustav Tavis Adolf of Sweden, heir to the throne, visited. His group of 18 went all the way to Phantom Ranch on a July day when it was 110 degrees at the bottom. The prince, aged 20, immediately went off alone to swim in Bright Angel Creek. In August 1926, a group of 32 scientists, teachers, and students from Princeton University made the trek to Phantom Ranch on foot. Florence Brooks of Fresno, California said, After being greeted by the genial and hospitable host and refreshing with good cold water, we were shown to our cottages equipped with cold showers and a comfortable bed. A splendid dinner revived us, new acquaintances were made, and the marvelous trip of the day was discussed. During 1925, Mule Skinner and Guide, Shorty Yarberry, the hen herder and guide at Phantom Ranch, reported that several men went into a big melon patch at the ranch and had stolen and destroyed many melons. Two men rode away to head off the men who were traveling up to the North Rim. Also, rangers at Roaring Springs were phoned, asking them to intercept the thieves. The men were caught. It was reported that Whitlock was in some sort of trouble about a car which he had stolen at Kanab, Utah, 
and abandoned at the canyon. He came here alone, but met up with the other men here and persuaded them to go back with him to fix things up when they got into this other trouble. They were taken up to the south rim and turned over to the justice of the peace. It was believed that in 1926, 20,000 people descended into the canyon on its trails. That year, an electricity-generating plant was built. A large force of men came down to lay a pipeline to the powerhouse, dynamiting a ditch. On Tuesday afternoon, at the beginning of the heavy rain which fell, lightning struck the tank, deflecting into the ground nearby, but in no way injuring the tank. The men were temporarily stunned, though not one was seriously hurt. In 1927, a large recreation building was added, and five more two-bed Santa Fe cabins were built, along with today's canteen dining room. Raw sewage had been piped into the Colorado River before being replaced with septic tanks and finally a sewage treatment plant. In 1927, Gertrude Gordon of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, wrote about her Phantom Ranch caretakers. Frank Cross and his wife are in charge, and they know how to make the stranger feel at home. The Crosses are famous for the rabbit pie. They have home-cooked jellies and preserves, and oh, how they can cook. In the evening, Cross would stop by to get breakfast orders on how to cook their eggs. Early in the morning, he would enter the visitors' cabins unannounced, there were no locks on the doors, and built a warm fire in their fireplaces. He brings over hot water for you, and if the pack rats have carried off the soap in the night, brings more. Mule Skinner and guide Shorty Yarberry was a character at Phantom Ranch. He was a Texas cowhand who had been at the canyon since 1919. Just before the mule company was ready to leave the ranch, Yarberry turned on the phonograph and told unsuspecting Gertrude a mournful tale that he wished he could learn to dance and asked her to teach him. She recalled, Although not much of a dancer, no one could resist Shorty's plea, and I encouraged him. You are a good dancer, I told him. You are light on your feet if you keep it up. But Shorty still was mournful. Somehow, it just seems as if I can't learn. A three-year veteran guide, Jack Way of Fort Worth, Texas, came by and said, That Shorty is the best dancer in the country. He just likes getting the girls to teach him to dance. Gertrude realized she had been spoofed. Yarbury was the most famous of the early guides employed by the Fred Harvey Company. Guides were a combination mule skinners, tourist guides, and entertainers. At Phantom Ranch, they made their headquarters at the mule stables. By 1928, about five employees were kept constantly at the ranch. The number of guides varied with the size of the tourist parties. One guide was assigned with each ten travelers, and often special guides are secured by smaller groups. In February 1928, with snow on the south rim, Worth Aiken of Maui, Hawaii, made the trek down to Phantom Ranch while his wife stayed in the warm comforts of El Tovar Hotel. He penned a letter from Phantom Ranch. It is beautiful down here, now in the dusk, with the towering cliffs above, and a mountain brook singing along in front of my cabin, and the weather at least twenty degrees warmer than up at the rim. If you could see me now, after a hearty, well-cooked beefsteak dinner, in this one-room, stone-walled, cement-floored cabin, with a roaring fire in a cute corner open fireplace. In 1929, a colony of beavers cared for the park employees in Upper Bright Angel Canyon migrated down to Phantom Ranch and started to cut down many of the beautiful shade trees that had been planted there. The park rangers were at first patient with the small residents. Park authorities have felt that the value of the few cottonwoods they destroyed in this locality is far less than the value of the beavers themselves and the evidence of their activities as a tourist attraction. There are few places along main travel trails where the tourists can see nearby old and new beaver cuttings. They eventually sent the beavers back up the creek, 
but they kept returning for many years. In 1930, Phantom Ranch was visited by about 500 to 600 people from June to September. The rest of the year had far fewer visitors because the North Rim was closed in early October. They have accommodations of a central dining hall, a large recreation hall designed for dancing, card playing, and other amusements. There was also a diesel-powered electric plant, a small orchard of peach trees, fig trees, and an alfalfa tract. The cottonwood trees that had been planted had grown to more than 50 feet high. A central restroom with showers and baths was completed. During peak times, about five employees stayed down at Phantom Ranch to take care of the visitors. One visitor remarked, I would have slept well had it not been for the croaking of the frogs. In 1932, it was observed, Nearly every day we see long trains of pack mules going down through one rim to the other. The rim-to-rim tourist trips are apparently few. For some people, the trip down the narrow trails is one of keen delight, while for others it is full of terrors which they have no desire to repeat. For those who ventured up to the North Rim, they found the prices to be outrageous. A pound of butter was 40 cents, and a quart of milk was 19 cents. A horse named Old Bob pulled a four-horse coach for more than a decade on the South Rim. He pulled kings and presidents. In 1932, as faster automobiles replaced his coach, Old Bob lost his job. Instead of being auctioned off, an official at the Fred Harvey Transportation Company let Old Bob retire to Phantom Ranch to graze along Bright Angel Creek. After eight years at Phantom Ranch, he died. In 1922, a small cable tramway on a cable of 500 feet was constructed upriver from the swinging suspension bridge that the Geological Survey used to monitor the river's water flow and silt. It can still be seen today. Taking a ride on the little tram upriver was a common activity in the evening for Phantom Ranch visitors. R.M. Clark, from Santa Monica, California, came down from the North Rim. He wrote, Three ladies that came from the South Rim and myself were the only visitors at the ranch this night. After our evening meal, it became a clear moonlight evening. The guide and a government official and we four visitors walked down to the Colorado River. We crossed the river in a tram attached to a cable. It was 9 o'clock p.m. when we returned to our camp, and we enjoyed the balance of the evening with music appropriate for the occasion. In 1934, the Civilian Conservation Corps built a swimming pool at Phantom Ranch behind the employee bunkhouse. It was 72 feet by 40 feet and 19 feet deep. They had to remove hundreds of massive boulders that the creek had deposited during floods over thousands of years. The pool wall and floors were concrete and rock. A tourist watched the construction and said, As if 5,000 feet of the canyon weren't deep enough, They're digging another hole for a swimming pool. Diverted water came from Bright Angel Creek. It would be a centerpiece of Fenner Ranch for many decades. Deer would drink out of the pool as they journeyed through the area. The pool was used until about 1969. It was discontinued because it was a maintenance chore, had been overused, and without chlorine experienced bacteria growth causing health problems. It was filled up in 1970 with many items, including hand-carved doors, a piano, oil-burning stoves, grills, a pool table, and items from the old blacksmith shop. Phantom Ranch continued to be a showcase, an adventure to visit for decades. Rim-to-rim hikers and runners passed through it day and night. I'll be home. With that, this is Davy Crockett, and this is the Ultra Running History Podcast. I hope you run fast and far, enjoy life, get outdoors, and most of all, stay safe and don't take unnecessary chances.